Welcome everyone to Santa Cruz Works Clinic Tax Provisions. And I should start my video because guys might want to see me, who knows. Uh, tax Provisions and Economic Relief, Business Impacted by Coronavirus. I am uh, your host today, uh, Doug. And on the line, we also have on the team, Matthew and Adrian, or you guys want to say hello? Hey, Doug and everybody, looking forward to today's webinar. And Adrian too. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So, a uh, happy Good Friday, uh, Passover to everybody. And uh, for me, it's Aloha Friday. Uh, today, we are um, going to do a webinar and a couple house rules before we get started, just so you know. You can hear and see us, but we can't hear nor see you. Um, raise your hand. There's a, a toolbar at the bottom, uh, typically at the bottom of your uh, screen or uh, a client. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can also put it in Q&A, which is probably the best thing is uh, let us know if you have questions of the speaker or of us. And then there's also a chat function, which you can use uh, to chat amongst yourselves. Um, remember to be kind and courteous. Uh, if we sense that you're not, we have the right to eject you. So uh, just uh, be nice. It's a, it's, a, it's a good Friday. Remember that. So um, today um, we're going to start with a quick announcement with Brandon uh, Napoli uh, before we, uh, so he has a one minute announcement. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, thanks Doug so much um, for allowing me to be a part of this uh, presentation. Uh, three quick things. First, my name is Brandon Napoli. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, we've been around for over 30 years um, and looking to grow our team uh, serving all businesses here in the county uh, through our advisor base. It's completely a free service. It's actually paid for by the city, the county of Santa Cruz, Workforce Development Board, uh, State of California, and the SBA. Uh, we have advisors, anything from marketing to finance to HR, to help you through these uh, different issues. Again, it's free of charge. If you're interested, you can always go to our website, Santa Cruz sbdc.org and sign up for services. We'll get back to you same day you're here from a human. Um, we also are doing our trainings over Zoom uh, going forward. So just stay tuned with that. The last is we're trying to really up our game with our newsletter, uh, really inspired by Santa Cruz Works and their newsletter, trying to distill the 15 hours of webinars and news going on every week into 15 minutes for you to really read through. So if you're interested in that, that's also you can sign up on our website. Great, thank you so much, Brandon. And uh, great, I think we're ready for the main show. Um, so we'd like to welcome today David Doolin uh, with uh, Pretunovich, Pew and Company, uh, which it's easier to say just PP and Co. But uh, welcome, David. Thanks, Doug, and thanks for allowing me to uh, speak to you. Thanks for to all of you joining us today. As you. I'm sure no, the, in the last couple of months, Congress and, and the federal government have put into play two uh, major economic stimulus bills and tax change bills um, that, um, and, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. The, the way we're gonna break up this presentation is the first part of it, I'm gonna talk about economic stimulus. The second part, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tax changes that loosened some of the restrictive provisions that were put into place in the 2017 Tax Act. Within the economic stimulus piece, we're gonna talk about a couple of provisions that the, uh, the government has provided for the SBA to, um, to make loans, economic recovery loans. We're gonna talk about requirements for employers to extend some sick pay and family leave. And we're gonna talk about how the federal government's gonna help you pay for that as an employer. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about some credits and deferral of, of um, payroll taxes. That pretty much covers the, the, the economic stimulus piece. And then we're gonna move and talk a little bit about changes in the tax law some of the 2017 Act were pretty restrictive in terms of using certain kinds of losses. 
and we're going to talk a lot about how the um, the CARES Act loosened those restrictions. So that's our show. Doug, you want to move on to the next one? Keep going. One more. And one more after that, please. So first part about this is a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, very simply, your tax returns are not due next week. April 15th deadline has been extended for, and, and actually before I wanna get into this, I wanna, I wanna issue a little bit of a caveat because this reminds me of that. The federal government put, together, put forth these laws very quickly. Um, and since then, Treasury, the SBA, uh, the IRS and your banks, your local banks, your SBA lenders, and state and local governments have been trying to interpret this. And this is very, very fluid and it's changing all the time. And the reason I bring it up now is because one of the provisions that I'm gonna talk about here uh, changed just yesterday. In addition, there's another provision that, that changed yesterday as well in a pronouncement from the SBA. It's incredibly important during this period of time that you work with your advisors very closely, your, your CPAs, your employment attorneys, your banks, to make sure that you're all working as a team to, to make sure that you get the best outcome you can get from this economic stimulus. And uh, not only that you don't miss out, but you, um, that you follow the rules that are changing by the day. So your taxes aren't due next week. Um, every tax payment related to individuals, corporations, um, trusts, and um, any non-corporate filers have been moved to July 15th for the federal government. The rule that changed yesterday was the second quarter estimated tax payment up until yesterday was still due on June 15th. Now that's been moved to July 15th. So it's very important that you know that not only your filing deadline, but your payment deadline has been extended to July 15th, both federally and the state of California. In addition to that, the state of California has liberalized a whole bunch of provisions related to the timing of payment of tax, including your, second, your first quarter sales tax. The first quarter sales tax isn't due until July 31st. And um, it, it, assuming you don't have, you don't owe more than a million dollars. In addition to that, there's a provision that you can get a 12 month interest-free payment plan if you owe less than $50,000. If you're filing an annual use tax return, that's not due until July 15th as well. Property tax payments are due today. That hasn't changed. Um, there are some provisions. A couple of the counties have already announced, San Francisco and San Mateo County have already announced that they've extended those, those deadlines to July or they won't charge penalties or interest to July. Uh, I'm, I haven't heard anything from our county. And um, so, but I do know that you can request a waiver of penalties if you're unable to pay your, your property taxes by today. Move. Next, please. Okay, now we're gonna start talking, the, the first part of this talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about the government's mandating that you provide for your employees some extended sick pay and extended family leave. Next, please. The, um, the extended sick pay and family leave relate to um, employees that were in your employ as of April 2nd. And um, if they meet the requirements, there are six requirements of the act, three of which involve extended sick leave and three of which involve family medical leave. But, but the, um, the bottom line is, that you're required to provide 80 hours of extended sick leave to your employee if they have um, been required to quarantine by the, the state government, they're sick, 
or they, they've been exposed and are in a personal quarantine program. Um, there are also some provisions to provide family leave if you, um, if one of your children is home from school. And that's what we're actually seeing the most of in our business that um, almost immediately a number of, in fact, our employees who are home with their children and don't have somebody else who's able to watch their children um, are eligible for an extended sick leave of up to six, uh, up to 10 weeks. And if you'd move to the next. So this describes the extended emergency paid sick leave. And again, that's for the, the six instances, one, the first three involving you, the second three involving a you and a child. Um, the paid sick leave is for up to 80 hours. It is um, up a maximum of $511 a day or um, the full amount of the pay that they receive for the period uh, just prior to that, and there are a number of rules on that, but, but suffice it to say that, that if an employee is affected by the virus um, in, and required to quarantine, one of the questions that came up early on and it's been answered since is, is a shelter in place achieve the level to be considered a quarantine? And it does not. So all of us that are sheltering in place do not yet fall under this, this sick leave. Next, please. Uh, the second part of this has to do with the, the extended family medical leave. That's a 10 week period of time starting after the extended sick leave ends two weeks into it. Um, and it, that includes provisions if you have to take care of a child or, um, or children because their school facility is closed there, um, and you have to not be able to work because of that. Now, the, next, please. So before I go on to this, the, the federal government is providing you a credit for the amount that you pay under these two leave plans up to a maximum of $5,000 per employee for the extended sick leave and $10,000 for an employee for the extended the um, extended family leave. And the way that you get that credit is you do not pay in your payroll taxes to the amount of credit that you're recovering. And you need to work with your payroll providers. They're getting up to speed on this. A week ago, they were not up to speed on this, but they're getting up to speed on it now. And um, if you have a problem with that, just know that it's your right to withhold those taxes to offset that credit. And on your 940, when you turn that in at the end of in, at the end of July, you will have a place on the 940 to reflect the amount that you recorded. The next thing I'm going to get into are the two loan programs that were that have come out of the last tax bill. Um, well, the first was on the the previous tax bill, and this is the one that goes directly through the SBA. That's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program um, or the EIDL program that we call it. Next, please. Now these programs work a little bit together, um, but, but what you need to know here is that the SBA, pro, the, the EIDL, the way you apply is, is go online, to sba.gov and you apply directly to the SBA. At the same time, you're eligible to apply for a $10,000 emergency grant. You must do this at the time of your application. Now, what we found out yesterday is that the SBA is now saying that they're gonna limit the amount of the grant to $1,000 per employee. So if you don't have 10 employees, you're not gonna be able to get the $10,000 grant yet. I have a number of clients who have applied for this. Generally what happens is you go online, you uh, need to submit some uh, historical tax returns and financial activity 
uh, there, it's not 100% clear how much they'll, they'll allow you to borrow under the program. The max you can borrow under the program is $2 million. Uh, there's a 30-year term, and the interest rate is 3.75%. The problem that I'm seeing with this is that the approval time is 30 to 45 days. I have yet to get a client actually receive one of these. And um, so the timing is a little slower than I expected. One of the things you have to realize in the whole process is that the SBA has 3,300 employees total. And um, I'm told that more than a million loans have been, been applied for since the combination of this program, the thing I'm gonna talk about next, were put into place. Next, please. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the Paycheck Protection Program. Excuse me. Now, I think this is what's been given the most press, and, and, and rightly so, because this is a government loan that's forgivable. Next, please. The key to this is to understand that there's a loan piece and there's a forgiveness piece and you need to separate the two. Right now, we're working on the loan piece. The other thing that you need to know about this is the loan piece is there are rules that are put forth in the law. Those rules have been interpreted by the SBA and they've given us some guidance that isn't necessarily in line with the law itself. In addition to that, the banks, who are the gatekeepers in this loan, have put forth additional guidance on what you should prepare to apply for the loan. And what I'm telling my clients, and what I did for our firm, is pay attention to your bank first, because they're the gatekeeper, they're the ones who are gonna get you access to the SBA and to the loan. Usually their, their requirements are more restrictive than the requirements put forth by the SBA and by the lender. And I'll just give you a little bit of background. When, when I, like I said, I applied for our firm's uh, payroll protection loan. Uh, we've obviously been economic damaged like everybody else. We put in our application a week ago Friday. Over the whole weekend, I got four different changes from my bank on requirements for the application. This past Monday, the application was complete. It was reviewed by our bank's internal departments on Tuesday, submitted to the SBA on Wednesday, and we haven't heard yet whether, whether or not we've received the loan. So this is taking a while to grind through the process. I have two clients that have received approval from the SBA. Neither of them have gotten loan documents yet. I don't anticipate any money being issued from these loans for at least two weeks. Now, um, I may be wrong, but, but that's, that's kind of where I am right now. So what are you supposed to do to apply for this loan? Well, it's based upon two and a half months, your average payroll for some period of time. What the law says is the last 12 months, which ended on March 31st, 2020. What the SBA has since come out and said is, look, if it's easier to provide documentation through 12-31-19, you can use the 2019 year. So what you need to provide them is the detailed records of your payroll, supported by a 941 or a 940, um, or you can use a state form, the DE6 or the DE9. You need to cap everybody's salary at $100,000 max. You come to a total, you add to that uh, the amount that you paid for health care and the amount you paid for a pension contribution. That comes up to a total. You divide by 12 to get an average for the months. Multiply that times 2.5, and that's the number you're supposed to be able to borrow. You, I, I've seen a number of different iterations on this calculation, but essentially that's the program. You can apply both for the payroll protection loan and the EIDL, but I, the proceeds can't be used for the same purpose. 
if you use the EIDL or the purpose of the EIDL is to pay payroll, you're supposed to refinance that with your PPL. Um, one of the things that's a little challenging about this, and I'll, I, again, this, this is relevant to, to our particular application. Uh, when it was submitted to the SBA, they came back to me and said there's another, uh, uh, this tax ID number has filed for another loan. So I know, and we were able to fix it up. It, it was an it was entry error, but, but the bottom line is we need to, we know that the SBA is comparing tax ID numbers. So do not go to two different banks and try to apply it through two different banks. Pick one and go with that one. Next. The um, interest rate on this loan is 1%. The term is two years. Um, again, the original, the original law said something different, but that's changed. Um, the, the payments are deferred for six months and um, the loan proceeds are supposed to be used for payroll costs, uh, mortgage interest payments, rent, and utilities, with 75% of the proceeds should be used for payroll costs. Next. Who's eligible? A business with fewer than 500 employees. 501c3s and c19s are eligible. That's very different for the SBA. The SBA is not a, an organization that typically lends to nonprofits, so, so that's um, unusual and added. And certain tribal business organizations are also included. Um, there, there are some rules about affiliates to get up to the 500, and just work with your advisor on that one. Next, please. Now we get to the other side of the, the, uh, the deal, which makes it incredibly attractive, and that is the forgiveness piece. What I will say in, in the very bottom line on this says that more details on loan forgiveness to be released. Well, the SBA has been so bogged down with issuing guidance on how to apply for a loan, they really haven't gotten to the forgiveness piece yet, and, and that is to come. But basically what the law says is that, that the eight weeks after your loan is, is entered into, and I'm assuming that's going to be the signing day, but it'll probably be funded within a day or two of that. In the eight, next eight week period, your payroll plus rent and, and utilities, and if you own a building, mortgage interest will be used as a reduction forgiven from that loan. Again, the limitation of the non-payroll piece is 25%. There are also a number of provisions that, that relate to employers who have had reduced payroll. If your business has been shut down, you've laid off employees. If your full-time equivalents this year, essentially compared to last year, most now versus last year has gone down significantly that could impede your forgiveness. Um, there's a provision, however, that if you restore it by June 30th, that, that you can still have it forgiven as long as it happened within that eight week period. Um, the rules that surround this are, are really uh, in transition. We haven't been given a lot of guidance for the, from the SBA yet, yet on this. What I'm telling my clients is get the loan. Let's worry about forgiveness after you get the loan. Next. Uh, as I said before, the, um, the banks are the gatekeepers. You apply for this loan through your SBA certified lenders. Uh, locally, County Bank is probably the biggest provider. Uh, well, and, and then the big banks, uh, you know, B of A, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, um, their doors close on Monday, then they reopen again. So they're, they're back in the business of accepting these loan applications. There are a number of others. The SBA website actually has a listing of, of um, SBA certified lenders. So check with that if you're having difficulty with your own bank. Next, please. Okay, so that's the two parts of the presentation related to the two loan provisions. And now we're gonna move on to a couple of employee retention credits.
Uh, this is kind of a unique situation because next please, if um, the employee retention cr credits have to do with a business that was shut down or, or forced to suspend operations due to the, the COVID-19 or their business gross receipts for, for any quarter in 2020 were less than 50% of what they were in the same quarter of 2019. That all makes sense. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in that position. What they're providing is a credit not, not to exceed 50% uh, for a maximum of $5,000 per employee of employees you retain during that period. And I have not it, um, yet had one of my employees, employers who, who have shut down that have been financially able to maintain their employees. So um, it, it's a great incentive for those who can do that. And obviously it's something the federal government and everybody wants, uh, but I just haven't seen a lot of it. The thing that's important about this is if you are applying payroll to the credits associated with the family medical leave or the emergency paid sick leave, or the uh, payroll protection loan, you're not eligible for this credit. Basically, the government says, look, you got all these opportunities to get funding from the government. You can't double dip on the same payroll. Next, please. The, um, the next piece, which is on the second half of, of this page, has to do with deferral of payment of employer taxes. And this is pretty much eligible to everybody. And, and really all businesses should be looking at this right now. If you are an employer who is paying payroll after March 27th, between March 27th and December 31st, the employer portion of your payroll taxes can be deferred until 2021, December 2021, and December 2022. Now, if you receive a payroll protection loan, you're not eligible for this deferral. Again, what I'm telling my clients is until you receive that loan, defer your payroll taxes. Once you receive the loan, you can, you can pay them back. Next, please. Okay, so that ends the portion of, of the discussion that surrounds the um, economic stimulus. Again, just to repeat, there are a number of credits available that are out there for employers. There are two SBA loans programs, one potentially far more fruitful because it's got a forgiveness piece, the payroll protection loan. There are some requirements that you pay additional sick leave or family medical leave in certain circumstances. And part of that, or all of that, may be recouped through reductions in payroll taxes. Now we're going to move on to the, the part of the program that, that deals with changes in the tax law that loosen up um, some of the restrictive provisions in the tax law that allow you um, potentially to have some economic benefit going forward. Next, please. The first one has to do with net operating losses. The Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017, way back in 2017, uh, eliminated the NOL carryback. Um, the, that means that if your business has a loss, what in, in a particular year, historically you've been able to carry that back to a year in which you made money and paid tax and get, grab some of that tax and bring it back and get the cash today. That was eliminated in 2017. The CARES Act went back and said, you know what, if you have a loss, and they're expecting losses in 2020, frankly, but if you have a loss in 2019 or 2018 or 2020, you can carry back that loss for five years. And the advantage of that, of course, is you can go back and get the cash. If you have a loss in 2020 and you weren't able to carry it back, then you'd have to wait for your 2021 year apply it against your profitable 2021 year, and you get the economic benefit sometime in 2022. What they're allowing now is you can go back, if it's a 2020 loss, 
you go back to 2015, you had a super profitable year, you can recoup the taxes that you paid in that year to the extent of that loss, and that'll provide economic stimulus. That is um, you know, very valuable to some people, and, and it's something you wanna pay attention to. Those of you that are anticipating a loss in 2020, be sure to talk to your tax advisors so that you expedite the filing process so that you're able to take advantage of that as quickly as possible. Next, please. The next area has to do primarily to real estate development or tenants. Uh, next, please. The, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, frankly, had a mistake in it. The, uh, in their propensity to get it through and sign, uh, the, the legislator made a mistake in what they'd intended for a, um, a tenant improvement in commercial property was that it be allowed a 15 year depreciable life, which provided that it was eligible for 100% bonus, which means that you basically can write it off in the first year. By a, a drafting mistake, it turned out that it's almost the worst depreciable life we can give in the Internal Revenue Code, a 39 year property, which, which deferred the depreciation deduction for a long period of time. The CARES Act changed that going back to 2018. So if you're a tenant who built out your building in 2018, 19, or 20, um, or going forward, you can, um, you can amend your tax return or potentially get a, have a catch-up provision, which allows you to deduct it all in, in potentially even 2019. And if you're a developer who provided that, that or a, a, a property owner who provided that, for your commercial tenant, you may be able to be eligible for that as well. Next, please. Um, the, the final thing, the final change that was made has to do with the, the ability of a business to deduct interest um, against their income in any given year. And uh, next, please. The the Tax Cuts and Job Act provided a, a limitation on the interest deduction to 30% of, of the calculation. And it's limited to companies that, are, that have $25 million or more in, in gross revenue, but, but um, those that do, that have this limit, limitation, it became very restrictive because of course, Congress now feels that, that the, um, the likelihood is that people's income will go down and the interest, of course, doesn't change. So many more would fall under the, the restrictiveness of this provision. They're, they're loosening it to increase it for 50% for 2019 and 2020. I, I think it's a little bit limited, but, but, um, but it's another provision that you need to pay attention to. Next, please. So that's the presentation. I'm, I'm available for uh, any questions that you want. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Dave. Um, take my, on my hat, I'm taking my hat off to you. Uh, the, uh, uh, Matthew, I think there are, you might have a few questions. Uh, yes, we do. We have quite a few questions. Well, about three questions. First of all, um, will, will we post this video? I, will we actually post these slides? And yes, I can answer that. We'll be posting it on santacruzworks.org, the, the full video in the next few days. So again, go to santacruzworks.org, probably in a couple of days, and that will be um, on our website. Um, here's another question. Are nonprofits eligible for PPP? Uh, again, 501c3 and C19s are eligible. Um, there are other nonprofits like um, business organizations like the Works or, or um, uh, certain other organizations like, like social clubs that are, are nonprofits, but they're not eligible for the PPP. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Does the PPP apply to S-Corps owners, payroll, 
or only to employees and not to the owners, um, like workers' comp does not apply to owners? Um, the, so an S-Corp payroll, uh, an S-Corp's owner's payroll or um, is eligible for the PPP, but again, it's limited to $100,000. Okay, thank you. There's um, some, and, and, and just very quickly, there's, there's some question as to whether guaranteed payments to partners, which is sort of the way that partners in a partnership get compensated, should or should not be included. And I've seen varying opinions on that, and I've seen varying banks. Um, some will allow them to be included, and some won't. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, qualified improvement property. Does this, uh, does this only apply to commercial properties? Yes. Okay. Easy answer. Oh, you know what? We have a, another question that just popped up right now. I've applied for the PPP and other loan programs as applicable in the contractors and self-employed, have heard nothing from SBA, and my bank said, thanks for applying, but we're out of money. What is the best option now going forward? FYI, I'm in the construction industry. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's so frustrating. I, I totally understand what this person is going through. Um, what I can tell you is that independent contractors or sole, sole um, proprietors were told that today, April 10th, was the first time you could apply for, for a PPP loan. Um, and I haven't seen their guidance on how they're going to do that yet. Uh, I don't think it's been issued. Um, but what I do know is if you go to the SBA website, there's a listing of um, SBA lenders. And I would, and, and some of them are, uh, you know, some of them are your normal banking institutions. And most banking institutions are requiring that you have an account with them. Um, Others, and, and some of them even go back to February 15th, that you had to have an account back then. Others do not. And so what, what we're suggesting is that, that you um, essentially try a couple of those organizations and, um, and, and do your best. But know that, you know, for independent contractors, the, they really pushed it out till today, April 10th, before the, um, the loan applications were intended to go in. So I'm surprised your bank already turned you down. They may have just be waiting to hear from the SBA. And, and my feeling is that the SBA must have held back some dry powder for this because that's a huge number of people. And the final thing on that is that, that you know, there is another economic stim stimulus bill in process um, that will include, we're told, an, another chunk of money to this payroll protection lo loan program. And hopefully that you'll be able to qualify for that, if not this. Okay, a couple other questions just came in. Um, one kind of a short one. How can we, can you repeat again how PPP is calculated? So the, the, the strict calculation or the simplified calculation is you take the previous 12 months payroll, you look at that payroll by individual and you limit the amount of payroll to each individual to a cumulative $100,000 over that 12 month period. You take that total and you add to it the amounts you pay for health insurance, and the amount you pay for um, any pension con employer portion of the pension contribution. And that's your total. There are some provisions in the law to add state, in state taxes, employer state taxes, uh, to deduct some federal taxes. Most of the banks I'm working with are saying, just leave those out. Come up with a calculation I just gave you, add it up, divide by 12, and multiply it times 2.5, and that's going to be the limitation on your ability to borrow. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, what categories are you advising clients to include in their um, EIDL claim? Um, well, primarily uh, 
you know, any sort of economic loss. So um, your payroll, clearly covering payroll, rent, all the things in the PPP are, the, are my primary ones. And frankly, those are like substantially all of the um, costs incurred by my clients. Uh, you know, cost of sales and, and inventory and things like that to me are, are related directly to sales. So if there's an inventory spoilage, I would include that in there. But if there isn't, I probably would leave it out. Um, does that include credit cards and short-term debt? That was one of the questions. Oh, um, I haven't seen that. Um, so I don't know the answer. Yeah, okay. Um, next question here. When the funds run out, like the previous person asked a couple of people ago, will there be additional funds for these programs or what is the prediction, your perspective? Well, my prediction, well, I know that the, the house is already working on an additional appropriations bill. So that's in process. Uh, I believe that it'll include a component for the an additional payroll protection plan loans. Um, I think there's an appetite in Congress to on both sides of the house to get something done and the president's not going to step in the way. I, I don't think so. I, I would say, you know, more likely than not. Okay. Um, next question. Um, David, can you talk a little about the timetables again regarding the PPP um, EIDL and the 10,000 advance and when we might be able to plan on any of these? Boy, great question. The, um, so I, again, the, the, let's talk about the payroll protection loan program or the payroll protection plan loan. Um, they're being applied for now. Uh, the SBA is looking at them. The SBA had, had approved them. The next step after that would be for the SBA to, oh, through your bank, to give you a loan application that you'd need to fill out um, or loan documentation that you'd need to agree to and sign. And then they need to fund it. So I'm, I'm just speculating, but I think it's going to take at least another week and a half to get that done. Um, the approval process itself is taking longer than I expected. So we'll see. The, I, I haven't seen any of my clients yet get the $10,000 grant. So, and, and some of them applied back to the middle of March. So um, I haven't, I've yet to see that. Or the SBA is saying it's going to take 30 to 45 days after application to get the EIDL loan. So I wouldn't plan on any of that in the next couple of weeks, uh, but hopefully I'm wrong. Okay, okay, David, the, the questions keep on rolling in. We got the next one here. Um, I'm a sole, um, sole proprietor and thought I had to apply for a PPP on Monday. You mentioned the date to apply started today. Should I apply again? I was given this advice from to apply from the SBDC. I would, I, if, if you've already applied, don't apply again. Um, but I would contact your bank as best as possible and, and find out where that is. Okay. Uh, next one, are cannabis industry businesses eligible for PP or EIDL loans? What about payroll tax credits? Um, unfortunately, the uh, the cannabis industry has been completely left out of the it, the SBA specifically excludes um, anybody related to um, the cannabis industry from eligibility, so they're not included. I um, I don't think that they're eligible. Well, I, I I don't know the answer when it comes to the um, the. Uh, extended family, I mean, the extended family leave and the, and the uh, extended sick leave applies to them. So presumably they could, could get the credit, but honestly, I don't, I don't know the answer to that part of it. Okay. Um, oh, another one just came in. I want to confirm health insurance is included in the payroll calculation. Would you repeat that, please? Um, I want to confirm health insurance is included in the payroll calculation. It is. Okay. Okay, good. 
Um, okay, I think that is the last question. There was a comment, someone just email, emailed me. Tell David, thank you for the webinar, really helpful information. So thank oh, you so terrific. much, David. And I'll, um, I'll send it over to Doug. Great, <laughs> thank you. Uh, again, thank you, David and, and Matthew for your help on the q and A. It's been a very informative web, webinar. And um, if uh, any of you are um, out and about today, just remember, wear your masks. Be safe, wash your hands, and uh, we hope that all of you uh, continue to stay healthy and thrive in this new era. So thank you very much to all. Thank you.